exciting to be here. Um, this will be a change of pace. I'm not going to be talking about the arch, so <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but I am going to be talking about a project I'm very excited about and very important to me, my firm, and many, many other people. I'm going to be talking about the conservation and preservation of the artillery sheds at Marfa, Texas. In many ways, this is a building preservation project of two buildings previously owned by the U.S. Army and then adapted and altered by the artist Donald Judd. But in many more ways, it's an art preservation project because where in these buildings the artist's installation ends and the building starts is not easy to determine, and that was by design of the artist. So I'm going to be speaking about a proposed study in which we will be studying the aluminum um, works of art inside the buildings, understanding the extreme temperature fluctuations they're currently undergoing and trying to understand what it means for the long-term health of those works in hopes that the knowledge we gain from this study will inform the museum and the members of the project team on some what appear to be fairly consequential decisions about the uh, conservation. You need some context, I think, for this project and the context is Southwest Texas, Marfa, Texas in particular, and to get to Marfa, Texas, you have to drive, and you generally have to drive a long way. And during that drive, um, you can't help but notice the landscape, in part because the landscape is so beautiful, and in part because there's not a lot of other things along the way to Marfa, Texas. Marfa, Texas is a small town, a population of about 2,000. It was once just a stop on the railroad to replenish the steam locomotives with water. And it's probably safe to say before uh, Donald Judd and the Chinati Foundation put Marfa on the map, if anybody knew about Marfa, it was because uh, Elizabeth Taylor, Rock Hudson, and James Dean made a movie there once back in the 50s. But on the south edge of the town is the Chinati Foundation. And the Chinati Foundation is a contemporary art museum based on the ideas of its founder and artist, Donald Judd. The mission of the Chinati Foundation is to preserve and present to the public large-scale um, art exhibits from a select few artists. Um, originally, it was conceived to exhibit the artwork of Donald Judd, John Chamberlain, and Dan Flavin. Today in the audience, a co-author of mine is Bettina Lagribi, who is the Director of Conservation. And um, it's also, I think, important to note that recently Frank Sanchez was in uh, Marfa, Texas is the Chinati Foundation has recently been put on the World Monument watch list, and it's very exciting for the institution. The grounds of the museum occupy 340 acres, which was once the Fort D.A. Russell uh, military base. The buildings that remain now that you can see on the uh, right-hand side, Donald Judd started first making interventions and in installations at the support of the Dia Art Foundation out of New York City. Here's a photo of the grounds with some of the outbuildings and barracks that are, remain. The first installations done on the museum were Donald Judd's 15 works in concrete, um, which are large works all along the eastern perimeter of the property. They become now part of the landscape, if you will, for the Chinati Foundation's property. You can see them there on the right-hand side of this image, this aerial view. The U-shaped buildings you see in that circular pattern are the uh, remaining barracks, six of which house light installations by Dan Flavin. And the two long, slender buildings with the silver roofs are the artillery sheds. There are other artists' exhibits, but it's safe to say the two artillery sheds are the center of Chinati's permanent uh, installations. They're two very... Um, large buildings. In them are a hundred untitled works in aluminum by Donald Judd. Each building is about 350 feet long, one a little bit shorter than the other, and 75 feet wide. They were originally gun sheds and used to store trucks or tractors that would pull cannons. Along each of the long sides of both buildings were roll-up garage doors, and the trucks would enter one side with the cannons in tow be uh, serviced and stored and exit out of garage doors of similar size um, on the opposite side. To say these structures simply house the aluminum works 
really understates the importance of these structures to the installation and what Donald Judd thought of them. As a matter of fact, his writings state that the size and scale of the buildings dictated the nature of the works that he decided to put in them, and such that the works and the buildings become part of one installation. And he modified the buildings for purpose. He removed all the roll, uh, rolled up uh, the garage doors and installed windows of his own design of single pane clear glass that flood the space with light and that interacts with the milled aluminum works. The precise fabrication of the aluminum works sits in contrast with the rough surfaces of the board form concrete and brick walls and uh, industrial floor slabs, yet the simplicity of both come together to make a unified whole. The light in Marfa changes throughout the day and such the interaction that light with the works changes. This is an image looking east at sunrise and for me I see warm soft surfaces despite intellectually knowing those are smooth hard aluminum surfaces. And yet at the same time of the day I turn and face the other way, I now see blue cool surfaces in the aluminum works but I still see the warm glow of the sunrise in the reflected single pane glass. Not only are the pieces in the space that they're in are connected as one, both of them are connected with the landscape. And you kind of sense this when you're in the buildings and you see the landscape all around you, as well as when you look into the buildings, seeing the works, being able to look through the buildings to the landscape beyond and the horizon in the distance. From the archives, in the upper left-hand corner, you can see what the Army called the gun shed. In the upper right-hand corner, around 1980, you see uh, the buildings as uh, Donald Judd was starting to alter them, and you can see the garage doors in it still. The lower two pictures are the buildings with the garage doors removed and the project underway. As I mentioned, the windows were Donald Judd's design, and they were fabricated and installed on site. Each window custom fit into the rough opening of the garage doors. I surmise this is so there wasn't any excess trim to try to deal with a prefabricated window size to fit multiple different uh, garage door sizes. There are 48 works in the south shed and 52 works in the north shed, each of them put in a particular place by the artist, and each location having a specific design by the artist. All 100 works have the same overall, uh, overall outer dimensions of 41 inches tall, 51 inches wide, and 72 inches long, but every work is of a unique design with different geometry within that volume. This is a fabrication drawing of one of the works. All of the uh, uh, works were fabricated by Lippincott Fabrication in Connecticut, shipped by them to the site and installed over a period from 1982 to 1986. All of the works are made of half inch thick milled aluminum that is fastened together at the corners with stainless steel threaded fasteners that are countersunk. Everywhere a plane, internal plane abuts the planes of plates around the perimeter. They're interconnected with friction fit hidden blind dowels. And here are the um, sheds after, initially after completion, and you'll note they don't have the large barrel arch roofs that they're known for on them yet. Um, originally, this was not the thought, but Donald Judd, I understand, became increasingly um, frustrated with leaks in the flat roofs. Um, ultimately decided it was futile to uh, try to repair those flat roofs. That was erroneous, but I guess many feel fortunate that he felt that way because ultimately he was inspired by agricultural storage units. He saw down the road in Valentine, uh, Texas and decided to install these barrel arches on both the roofs. And thus, we get the artillery sheds as we know them today and they are iconic for the Chinati Foundation. Ironically, it didn't solve the water problem. 
uh, <coughs> the contractor's decision on how to create, it, create a gutter was a complete failure, and uh, Donald Judd was, was not happy with the results. But the barrel arches come down and are founded on the flat concrete roof right up against and adjacent to a short concrete parapet wall that goes all around the perimeter. So you can see in this image here the concrete parapet wall and the barrel arch. And you can imagine that complicated geometry of volume that occupies between the steel arch and the concrete wall as you have the um, undulating barrel arch. The contractor filled that complicated volume with sand, sprayed urethane foam on top of it, and covered it with a waterproof coating. It was never watertight. Uh, the sand became moist and started corroding the bases of the barrel arches. At some time in the past, somebody cut these cute little hatchways in each and every rib of the arch and removed the sand, which was very helpful. But any water that gets past that gutter coating is now cools between the angle that attaches the arches to the base of the concrete floor slab and the back of the parapet wall. This area, is, this area here is unroofed, so that water gets directly into the space. It goes directly into the space and becomes a headache for Bettina. Even if the gutters were completely watertight, they were woefully undersized for the volume of water that can be in a downpour in Marfa, Texas. So the water goes over the edge and down the front of the storefront windows, which are now 30 years old. They never did have proper sill flashing underneath them with appropriate M dams. And they never really had the type of perimeter joint that you would need for a long-term durable seal. Plus, the gaskets are now shot, so much water comes in through Judd's windows as well. In addition, water that's been splashing against the concrete curb on the outside has etched the glass and hazed it. And any water that hits the works themselves becomes a labor of love for Bettina and her staff to figure out how to clean it. But we know Donald Judd didn't like the gutter, and so we can unabashedly come up with an intervention to fix this. We can put an appropriate membrane throughout the attic space on insulation that slopes it. We can put the metal hut on a structural curb that will now form a gutter of reasonable geometry that we can reliably waterproof, as well as handle the volume of water. So this decision is fairly straight easy, very easy. In contrast, the decision of what to do about the storefront windows, as those are the artist's design. Do we replace them in kind? Do we refurbish them where they are? Or is much more difficult and consequential decision? In particular, when you consider the fact that it gets stifling hot in those spaces throughout the year. This is a uh, result of an energy model that takes one year's worth of data. You can see the white light lines, it's the air temperature throughout a year starting in January and ending in December. Of course, it's the hottest in the summer. But that jagged nature of that line is telling us that there's 10 to 20 degrees temperature change each and every day that the aluminum works need to go through. In addition, the two red lines are our uh, modeled predictions of the temperature of the aluminum. The lighter line at the top is the temperature of the aluminum on the sunny side, and the darker red line is the temperature of the aluminum on the interior side. You can see on the sunny side, it also goes through daily cycles, and it's considerably hotter than the air during the winter months. And maybe most importantly, is there's a, shows that there is a temperature gradient across the work in the winter months between the window side and the interior side. So undoubtedly, after 30 years of this type of annual exposure, the condition of the works have changed. And exactly what, how much it's changed is the current study that Bettina and her staff are, are undergoing. But there are certain observations that it's, it's very plausible or the results of this thermal cycling. One of the observations are gaps that are forming between the interior plates and the exterior perimeter plates that you can see here. Some cases it's as thin as sliding a piece of paper between it. In other cases it's as much as an eighth of an inch and you can start to see the hidden pin dowel that's between the gaps. We know, uh, 
knowledgeable people know that Donald Judd would not have accepted such a gap, so it's surmised that they weren't there upon installation. Additionally, the fasteners at the corners, the thread fastener at the corners have become loose. They need to be retorqued, and some of them, or a few of them, are now such that they're not able to be torqued to their specifications. And they move. Some of the works move more than others. This is a plan view showing a work number 28 has moved over time. Um, each one's going to move differently because they're all of different geometry. And the way these aluminum structures are going to respond and behave in the therm thermal cycles is going to be a function of that geometry. <clears throat> so we looked at possible, modeled possible interventions. The upper left-hand graph is the one I described earlier, and then across the top is if we keep single-pane glass. The middle shows that air exchanges can make a slight difference in the overall air temperature, but does not change the uh, flu daily fluctuations, and it does not have a large impact on the temperatures of the aluminum. If we add HVAC to our model, of course we can tell the model never let the air be hotter than 75 and never less than 65. So the air temperature is, is controlled, except we still have cycles during the spring and fall, and we still have temperature gradients and cycles in the aluminum. If we look across the graphs on the bottom, we're seeing the results of if the single pane glass is replaced with IGUs and low E. Um, you can see if that's all that we do, we do make a modest difference in the, t in the temperature uh, and the fluctuation, but we make a dramatic change in the temperatures in the aluminum. The aluminum now is not getting the solar gain that it would ordinarily get, so they're not little heaters in the space, and now the, heat of the, the, the temperatures of the aluminum are essentially averages of the temperature of the air. Air exchanges, as you can see, help. And of course, both IGU low E glass and HVAC, you can start to approach conditions that might be more, more common for the storage of art. However, those of you in this room probably know better than I the consequences of changing single pane glass to, to IGUs and the architectural ramifications. And I think that's only more acute if you think of this not in terms of architectural ramifications, but in changing an artist's intention. If you think about the HVAC equipment, even if it can be hidden up into the attic, the addition of vents throughout the ceiling space would have a definitely impact on the quality and simplicity of the space. And you can't tell from this photo, but when you're experiencing this installation, it's very quiet and very silent, and there's concerns about that being marred by the hum of mechanical equipment. So we have to ask, Clearly, um, the, arts, the, the aluminum works are in conditions well outside norms for storing art, but these are consequential decisions, and is it really necessary? Maybe we better best understand the behavior of the aluminum um, in this space. So being an engineer, I like to look at a graph, and Bettina and I used this graph when we spoke with the original fabricator, Alfred Lippincott, who visited Marfa recently. I can surmise that it's very likely after 30 years, these works in aluminum have kind of self-acclimated. These opening of gaps and loosening of fasteners are relieving internal strain of the work that goes through the thermal fluctuations, and perhaps, maybe optimistically, that the rate of change is plateauing over time. So perhaps things don't get much worse if we don't take these um, drastic intervention measures. But we don't know, and this is the subject of the study that we have embarked on. We started by getting a year's worth of data where we put data loggers on three of the aluminum works and we're getting multiple, uh, we're getting temperature from multiple locations within each work and we're getting temperature within the space and um, exterior temperatures as well. What we found after a year is actually it's a little more acute than our preliminary model showed us. We have a maximum aluminum temperatures of over 130 degrees. We get maximum daily change of the aluminum temperatures of uh, above 40 degrees. We're seeing maximum differential across a work of as much as 20 degrees and peak air temperatures of 111 degrees. And you can see the blue line at the top, you can see how it peaks with morning sun and the lighter colored line on the bottom that peaks in the afternoon from uh, the western sun. 
So we can use this data to calibrate and validate our models. There's another very important piece of information we need to make the models work, and that's the emissivity of the aluminum, which is very, very sensitive to its surface. Uh, conditions, unfortunately, you can't get this non-destructively, so we're going to have to take small samples and emulate as closely as possible the actual surface conditions of the work so that we can model it appropriately. Essentially, the emissivity is the uh, measure of how much of the solar radiation that hits the surface is absorbed and emitted versus reflected. But with the uh, data logging, and uh, better um, surface properties, we can do computer modeling, which will be done in two parts. One part will be a whole building energy model. It will do with Energy Plus, and another part will be a finite element model that we build of initially of the three works and um, of the um, eventually perhaps more as needed. The Energy Plus model will take care of the outside temperatures, uh, account for solar radiation, re-radiation of the interiors, ultimately giving us temperature of the materials and inside air as a function of time. And the Abacus finite element model will give do heat transfer analysis and structural stress. So essentially, we'll be taking the energy plus model. It'll be input to the finite element model. And out of the finite element model, we'll get aluminum stresses, screw and fast pin forces, and movement. A little pilot study here that we did for a hypothetical box where we did sequentially heating each of the four sides, the motion that you saw there is exaggerated, but we see in even one cycle, we start to get the work to walk even a, a bit more than uh, two millimeters. So we get this data, and the next step is to do the assessment. We'll be doing the assessment by looking at the stresses and comparing them to material elastic limits. We'll look at uh, fastener deformations both analytically and through mechanical testing. And most importantly, we'll have to look at the uh, fatigue fragility to see when and if we need to have a risk of cracking. So in conclusion, one, go to MARFA. You will not regret it. It's a wonderful experience. It's fair to say that it's changed me in some ways. Um, two, um, become a member of the Chinati Foundation. You'll be supporting good people doing good work. But clearly, these works are in an environment that are well outside the norms of what art would ordinarily be stored in. But the intervention to make a change from that has such consequence that um, a study to clearly understand the response of the aluminum to these temperature swings would be helpful not only to the museum, but to the project team that have to ultimately make these difficult decisions. Thank you.